and Rory is actually travelling in Australia at the moment. He's not Barbara, but I'm not sure if she's here um, this evening, but she was due to come this evening to represent him. Edward Mason's going to be meeting the moment. Michael Keenan, James Lucy, uh, Ben Ng, Andrew, John, Andrew Driscoll, Rita Pierce, Anne Allen, Edward Moran, Noel Riley, Valerie Bailey, William Murray, Natalia Tkoga, and Stefan Spitka, um, Anne McCaffrey, Ian Quigley, Gail Pierce, Joseph Furlong, Suzanne Leary, Lionel McCarthy, Emer Hosper, Liam Mills, Melina Lenkova, Adrian Kennedy, uh, Donna Bond, who's here representing her mum, uh, Patricia uh, Gannon, Sandra Keating, Reginald McMahon, Jacinta Kendrick, the Dwyer family, represented by uh, Bernie Dwyer, represented by her daughter this evening, uh, Lisa Ann, and Martina Delaney, Charles Dobbin, and Anne Beverly. The professional submissions were from uh, Agnella Craig in Trinity, Trace Harvey St. James's, Noreen O'Regan in St. James's, Eva Boren, Joy Norton, Alison Connolly in St. Luke's, uh, Wendy Thomas in the Dental Hospital, Sarah Trout, Joanne Dowes, and John Mark Mosco. And um, uh, Mr. Uh, Toby Carlin from St. Luke's also. Uh, finally, I want to thank the Dublin Dental Hospital, who so generously facilitated the Motorola project. Uh, in particular, the executive with uh, Professor June Nunn, uh, Michael Sullivan, and uh, Pat O'Boy. The dental hospital board need to be thanked also. And in particular, the wonderful staff in the dental hospital, all of us, all of us who are colleagues and friends, and we make every day special uh, when we come into work, in truth. Um, and of course, in particular, the staff in Division 2, uh, particularly Deborah, Kathy, Rose, Dalda, Eva, and Mel. And last, but by no means least, my co-editor, Leah Mills. Leah's knowledge and experience in the publishing world, she's published numerous books already, um, was totally invaluable. I went into the project completely blindly, and I had no idea of the work involved in producing a book. And certainly, none of this would have happened without Leah. So I would now like to hand over to Leah Mills. Bernie Dwyer, who was on our editorial committee, was a valued friend. 
Stefan Sinka, Patricia Gannon, each one of them loved and missed. Each has made a lasting contribution to the well-being of the future patients. You all have, everyone who's worked on this book. But it's not my job to introduce the book. I'm here to introduce Peter Sheridan, who actually needs no introduction from the likes of me. Peter is a master storyteller in as many forms as you can think of. He knows all about the healing power of stories and the risks people take in telling them. He's a novelist, a prize-winning playwright and screenwriter, and a memoirist. He's also a director and performer, generous with his time in working with community groups. I think it's fair to say that he's a committed activist working the tricky borderline between art and life. He was a founding member of Slot Players and an early and influential member of Project Arts Centre. He's also worked with groups like Team Educational Company and the Open Door Literacy Series. What comes across in Peter's work is an extraordinary zest for living. His work combines equal parts of curiosity and compassion with tireless energy and a belief in the power of theatre to transform our lives and our sense of ourselves. A list of his plays shows how deeply his work engages with the social concerns of our time and place. Paint of Black, No Entry, Women at Work with Jim Sheridan, The Liberty Suit with Madness Flynn, Emigrants, Diary of a Hunger Strike, The Rock and Roll Show, and more obscurely, Shades of the Jelly Woman and Finders Keepers. You have to explain those in future. He also has a novel, Big Fat Love, and a novella for the Open Door series, Old Money, New Money. His memoirs so far are 44, Devil Lady, 47 Roses, and Great Leg, and the last two are also stage plays which he performed himself. Together, they tell an ongoing story of an individual, of a family, of love and grief and secrets, of the redemptive power of theatre and of the city that houses them all, our city, still evolving and waiting for the next instalment of Peter's memoir. He's been a strong supporter of the Med Cancer Awareness Campaign from the beginning. He's never said no to anything we've asked him to do for us. Not yet. Please welcome Peter Sheridan. Drive to the Californian border, 
Draw your manuscript over the state line and draw it away as quickly as you possibly can because they will destroy it. So I began explaining to him, of course, that Bobby was a person, um, but he had saved my life. He was my doctor, my oncologist, and he was really telling me about the story. So the next day, I get the paper, and of course it says, Holly would say it's a lot of joy, was the headline in the newspaper. So I came back to Dublin, and I had my appointment with Don, and I told him the story. And she loved it. He couldn't stop joking to himself. But I said, no, no, don't get too carried away with this, because I said, I have a daughter, she's a teacher in the inner city, and then, um, when she started in her school, she came home and claimed to me that there was nothing on the walls of this school and they needed to frame the place up a bit. And she wanted to put up posters of some of my plays. And I said, oh, I don't think so. They'd, they'd be saying it's nepotism, you know, that you're trying to advertise your father's work. But you could put up something like those famous Irish writers. You know that poster? You see it around the place, Shaw, Peckett, Brendan Bean. An absence of women, but lots of guys on the poster. Anyway, I said, you should put that poster up. And then there would be no compromise, I won't feel bad. So she put the poster up on the wall. Uh, she teaches in the Larkin College in the north of her city. So you can imagine <coughs> the kids are fairly direct, you know. They don't get so words. So a kid came up and said, Miss Sherry, um, you see them writers? Do any of them write catch? My daughter's thinking, oh, I don't think Joe's ever wrote anything called catch. Yeah, she said, no, 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 I don't think any of them are attached. Ah, no, miss, I don't think they're called attached. I mean, did any of them really catch that Joey looked like them? Did any of them really You know what happens if you get a big head, so I told them on that story as well. You like that one. So, I just wanted to say about uh, the book, Word of Mouth, which is a great title. Um, it's a very important book, um, and it's full of technical stuff, which is important if you've been through the process. For somebody like myself, you know, I go to the glossary, I look up a lot of words that matter to me, and then I check out what they mean. So it's got all that really good information that's important to you. But the thing that really meant to this book are the voices of the people who've been through the process. Because what they do is they tell the truth from their perspective. And all great communication is about telling the truth. It's about trying to connect to people, to tell them something that burns away the cross, that burns away the artifice, and connects to the heart and the head. And these stories are full of them. And I love the fact that you didn't try to editorialize what people were saying. So when some of the contributors go into a little bit of detail about the technical side of their treatment, I've got to tell a story about them. <laughs> I can now not tell the story about the phone. I'll back to the book. This is a true story. In 2009, I did a production of the Shawshank Redemption in the Gaze of Theatre. It was the world premiere of the stage version of the Shawshank Redemption. And I had the great privilege to direct this piece, which happens to be one of my favourite films of all time. And one of the constant things in the theatre nowadays is how do we stop phones going? So we were suggesting that not alone should we make an announcement at the beginning of the play, but we should make an announcement at the end of it, because people who use their phones at the end will never get. And phones are going off and it kills the atmosphere. So we were talking about all this. We decided not to go out and make a second announcement. We just went with the announcement at the top of the show. So on the third night of the show, I'm in the stalls of the gay theater watching the play when the phone goes off. And everybody's looking around. And then I realize it's actually not in the auditorium. It's on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> One of the prisoners <laughs> had gone out into the lane at the end of the make a phone call, put it in his uniform, and forgot that it was there. And he's standing there, and I can see the look of terror on his face as I'm looking at him. But it being Dublin and talking about putting to the car the truth, some Dublin wag shows up, it's his cell phone. For those who don't know, the Shawshank Redemption is set in prison. <laughs> <laughs> For one or two places, one thing, why 
probably not this one. <laughs> but I mean, that is just the truth, isn't it? And again, it's, you can't invent those stories. They just happen. And this town is full of those kinds of stories. And this town is full of storytellers. In fact, this society that we live in is based on storytelling. The thing we do absolutely brilliantly in this country is uh, the arms. And it kind of comes from our history. It comes from the dynamic of losing a language that we once had and finding that we're using a different one. And we're using the new one, but we're thinking in the old language. I often talk about this stuff when I'm away. And people are always fascinated by that complex of English and Irish that we have in Ireland and the charge that we use the language. This amazing connection, this imposition of two languages that takes place. So now, I was just talking to somebody earlier on when I came in the door and said to me, you know, there's no word for an all in Irish. Which is true, sha and me ha mean it is and it isn't, but it's not quite known. And then we get a language that gives us a yeah, definite yes and a definite no, we don't want to do it because we kind of much prefer that it is and it isn't. <laughs> 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 anyway, going back to why the book works and why these invoices and the fact that both are really important is that they tell the story from the perspective of the people who went through this process. And then telling that there's, as I said, there's repetition of procedures that people went through. But I love the fact that you didn't get to talk about it today. I think that really makes it that you just allow people to speak in their own rhythm, in their own pace. And there's lovely stuff in there. There's really wonderful stuff in there. And I think that's what people will connect to in this book. They'll connect to the personal stories of the back. Because they are the ones that connect to their heart. And literature and writing is all about connecting to the heart and moving people. And I was deeply moved by this book. And I want to wish it all the best as it travels on its journey towards hell. It'll never have to change its life like my book did. Even in America, they get more of hell. So, all the best with this. My blessings on it one day at a time. And thank you for having me here. It's always a pleasure.
changed and evolved over the years, and she's gone on and done lots of studies and is um, in the process of uh, completing a thesis at the moment. So, um, and did a huge amount of work on the, on the book during the summer. So, uh, we're very, very grateful to her. I'd now like to um, introduce Edward Mason, uh, who is uh, living in Dublin, but he is from the southeast, from Wexford, and um, he's going to read a piece from um, his memoir, also. Thank you very much. Download 
will free of charge to others who would wish to have a copy. And if you would like to make a donation to acknowledge that, then there are contribution boxes to our um, around the room, so please do so. This has been a fabulous evening put together by a very large group of people. The Alumni Committee, and we're sorry that Barry is with us tonight, but we're delighted that he's doing so well. Um, the school and hospital, I would like to thank my colleagues on the executive team, uh, and in particular the heads of division, um, Jacinta McLaughlin, Lisa <coughs> Martin, Stephen Flint, and David Coleman, who have been so supportive, full of ideas. Um, what's the plan B, what's the plan C, uh, as we see tonight, to make sure that this evening came together to applaud our distinguished alumni and also to applaud such spectacular patients who have given so much for others um, in the culmination of this book tonight. I want, though, please, to thank um, in particular the household team and the facilities team who have made all the practical arrangements that have made this evening come together. But two people in particular are Lena Doherty, our school administrator, and Ronnie Harrison, who we met at the bar here on the landing, who without whom uh, this evening would not have actually happened. So thank you.